Bible study this morning, and we're going to be continuing with our class, or our series of classes on the sins that we find in various lists throughout the New Testament. Today we're going to be looking at Romans chapter 1, verse 30, the inventing of evil things. So let's go ahead and remind ourselves of this particular passage. Romans chapter 1, starting at verse 28 through 32. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient, being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignity, whisperers, backbiters, haters of God, despiteful, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, without understanding, covenant breakers, the list goes on, who knowing the judgment of God that they which commit such things are worthy of death, not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. So, in the context of chapter 1, starting at about verse 21, I want to say, what's really the discussion? Does anybody, is anybody familiar with that passage? What's beginning to be described here? It talks about individuals that hold the truth and unrighteousness and what's being described as far as this society. What's going on with this society here? Are you looking for that they are involved in idolatry? Like, what's being described in terms of, like, why, why, why is all of this coming to pass? Because they did not like to retain God in their knowledge. They moved away from God. That's it. So, and what does God really represent? So Caleb said for those watching online, uh, he said these individuals have moved away from God. They don't want to retain God in their knowledge. And as a result, uh, these different sins are be- beginning to proliferate throughout the society. And what does God represent in terms of presenting this? He represents a standard that we can look to so that we can recognize when these, when these things are beginning to take place in our society and we can try to take uh, basically evasive action. We can try to right the ship, so to speak, correct the course of society. Now, we're going to look, as we're checking out inventors of evil things, we want to try to tack down what it is we're talking about. We want to try to define this term, the, in, the inventing of evil things. When we think of inventions... What are some things that pop into our heads? What comes to mind when we think of inventions or inventors? Cotton gin. Cotton gin. All right. Anything else? Thomas Edison. Edison. Light bulb. Light bulb. So we think of things that are basically physical objects, don't we? We think of innovative products, uh, generally something that can be marketed or shelved, uh, something that can be used, a tool. As we're looking at this concept of inventing evil things, inventors of evil things, that's going to be a part of it, but it's not going to be the entire story. And the reason that I want to make sure that we look at it is because I don't... Inventing of evil things, it can encompass more than just the invention of a physical object or the creation of a physical object, but I don't want the concept to become so diffuse that everything just becomes an evil invention or a good invention. We want to tack it down and make it a little more clear than that. So... These are a couple of the Greek words. Now, you all have the benefit of a piece of paper that I passed out to you. Um, I know that when we start talking about these different Greek Greek words and we show these definitions on the screen that it can look like just kind of a jumble. So I encourage everybody to go ahead and make use of their handout so that if we're not able to spend time on as much time on every slide as we might like, uh, you will have that to refer to as we go forward in the conversation. Inventors, we haven't read, that's ephurites or ephurites. Evil things, kakos, we're going to be looking at those two words right now. Now, inventors, the word translated inventors, ephurites, it means a discoverer, a contriver, an inventor. Now, when we think of discovery, somebody discovering something, What does that generally involve? That's not just the creation of a product, but it's what? A discoverer, a contriver. It's the process, right? Thomas Edison, what did he do when he was trying, since that was an example, before he created the light bulb, what did did he create? Uh, I know that he 
quote, failed 900 times. Right. So he said, I found a thousand ways not to make a light bulb, right? So we're talking about over time, there was concerted mental energy planning. So th when it's talking about an inventor, it's actually including the process, the mental energy that's spent, the planning, the preparation. All of these things are going into a final product that manifests itself later on. The word heurisco, uh, that's actually going to be the root word of this word, efuritas, and in that root word is the concept of finding, obtaining, perceiving, seeing. So there's a great deal of mental energy, the, the process of uh, applying one's mind to the situation is definitely a part of the meaning in this idea, inventors of evil things. Now, Kakos, this is that word uh, that we get the, that, that is translated evil in inventors of evil things. And the idea is worthless, intrinsically worthless, not uh, necessarily in terms of the, like, what is it? It's um, it's something that's actually intrinsically worthless. The nature of it is that it's a, a worthless or potentially injurious thing or an injurious thing. It's not necessarily descriptive of just the effect. And we're going to be looking at a couple of examples to kind of differentiate that in our mind a little later on. But the thing to key in on is when we're talking about the inventing of evil things, we're not just talking about the finished product. It's not just, okay, here we have you know, this device that can only possibly be used for evil only. But we're also talking about the process that went into it, the fact that an individual spent a, a great deal of mental resource on it, a, a great deal of energy on it. It's the planning process. And we're going to see that it doesn't actually necessarily have to just be a product. The inventing of an evil thing can actually include the idea of creating a philosophy or a plan, a, a, a mental construct, now, in the Hebrew, there's a corollary to these words, the idea of inventing evil thing or inventing a thing. And the corollary, this is the root word of several words that we're going to be looking at. It's kashab. It means to weave, to fabricate, to plot or contrive. Okay, so there's the idea of the mental energy, right? The planning process. To think, regard, value conceive, invent, to purpose. So this is the mental aspect, not just the physical aspect. When we're talking about inventing, inventing evil things, it's coming up with these concepts, coming up with these ideas, making plans to bring something to, to fruition. That's all part of the inventing of a thing. We're going to be looking at this word. Now this word, kishabone, it comes from this, this root word. And if you're tracking, I have in red there, 2803. As we're looking at these other words, you'll notice that each of them has this red 2803 pop-up. Kishabone from 2803. Makashaba from 2803. So they're all coming from the same word, right? To, plot, to plan, to plot, contrive, to, to uh, conceive. And the meanings of these words can mean actually mental. So it's an actual, it's a contrivance. It's a construct, either actual, a warlike machine, so the invention of a physical product, or mental, a machination, so a, a, a concept that somebody is producing and working on and developing. So the reason I'm pointing this out again is as we're going forward and we're talking about the idea of what it means when somebody is inventing evil things and how to recognize when an individual is inventing evil things or even to recognize an evil invention, we're not just talking about a physical device, like somebody would say, well, a gun, right, is used to hurt people, and so therefore it's an evil invention. That's not the way to conceive of this. And we're going to see more of that as we go forward. We're going to develop that idea further. Now, I know that's a lot of Greek words, and nobody in this room is a Greek scholar, but I'm saying, like, does the stuff that's being presented here make sense so far to everybody? We tracking so far? Okay. All right, now we're going to be looking at some examples of how these words are used. We're going to be taking a look at 2 Chronicles chapter 26. This is going to be an example where we're going to see all three of these words are going to be used in such a way as I think it'll be able to help us start to develop an understanding of this idea to invent a thing. Now remember, in these 
different words that we've looked at. These are the Jewish uh, words, the Hebrew words, uh, kishabon, mekashaba. We're going to be seeing these words along with their root word back here, kashab, used in the following passage. So this is Uzziah. Uzziah is preparing for war. And it says in verse 3 of Second Chronicles chapter 26, 16 years old was Uzziah when he began to reign. He reigned 50 and two years in Jerusalem. His mother's name also was Jecolia of Jerusalem. And he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord. So what we're going to be seeing here is and in, he's actually doing right in the sight of the Lord. And this is going to be attached to the idea of the example I just used where just because something is like, say, a gun and it's designed, its design is actually to be able to cause uh, damage to somebody else, another human being. We're not going to say that, well, the, therefore, that is an evil invention. And that's what's meant by the idea an evil invention. We're going to see that here because he's doing that which is right in the sight of the Lord in verse four. Verse five, he sought God in the days of Zechariah, who had understanding in the visions of God. And as long as he sought the Lord, God made him to prosper. And he went forth and warred against the Philistines and break down the wall of Gath, the wall of Jabna, and the wall of Ashdod, and built cities about Ashdod and among the Philistines. So he's going to war against the Philistines. This is something that's, this is activity that's approved in God's sight. Uh, he's not being condemned for this. Verse 14 of the same uh, chapter, 26 of Second Chronicles. And Uzziah prepared for them, throughout all the host shields and spears and helmets and habergens and bows slings to cast stones and he made in Jerusalem engines Kishabon invented Makashaba by cunning Kashab men all right so there's all three of those words that we were just looking at and this is the invention process that we're that we're taking notice of where it says engine that's a physical object that's been created right He's, it's talking about a physical device and there's our, our word for invention and related to a physical device we have our word makashaba with that carries along the meaning of a mental contrivance, a planning, a perceiving, a conceiving of something. And that word is translated invented. And then we have individuals that are described as being very cunning. And these are individuals who, if we look at our word, our word definitions, kashab, to plot, to contrive, to regard, conceive, invent, purpose, so when we're looking at the invention process and how these words are used, how the Hebrews would have understood it, it's the entire process, the inventing of something from finish to end that involves the mental activity as well. In this particular case, it results actually in a machine, a device that is able to be used for a purpose. But we're going to see that it's not always going to have to uh, wind up being a physical device it can actually just be a plan. Cindy? It's not. It's going to be a different word. But it's possible that the, like if you look at the definitions, that some of those, you know, some of the meaning might carry over, but it is a different word. I, I did remember looking at that. Yeah, it's a different word. So now we're going to be looking at, now this is a physical device, right? The invention of a physical device. Now we're going to be looking at these same words. These are Hebrew words. They're going to be used in relation to a righteous plan. And this is 2 Samuel uh, chapter 14, verse 14. For we must needs die and are, and are as water spilt on the ground, which cannot be gathered up again. Neither doth God respect any person. Yet doth he devise, kashab, means, makashaba, that his banished be not expelled from him. Now, when we're talking about the plans that God has for his people to be able to preserve them, generally, we're think, I mean, what do we think of? Do we think of like a physical device? I'm not saying like, the physical realm is going to be excluded completely when it comes to means. But when we're, when we're looking at this, do we see how it relates actually to a plan that's being produced? God has a plan. It's a construct of mind. And these same words that are being used in relation to a physical object are also being used in relation to actually a plan that God has. It could be a plan basically that anybody has, just the plan itself. Now, as we're talking about 
a plan, or if we're talking about an invention being evil or not evil, as we're considering that concept, what's going to be the determining factor? If we're trying to decide, okay, there's a design that somebody has, some sort of a plan that they're developing, or there's an invention that they're creating for a particular purpose, if we're going to be trying to categorize something as either good or maybe neutral versus evil, what's going to be our standard? Just looking for a very basic answer. <laughs> like what? Bible, right? Okay, so God is going to be the standard. When we're trying to determine the value of something morally, we're going to be trying to compare it. We have to have a standard to compare it to. Now, as Christians, we're going to go ahead and say, well, that's going to be the Bible. The Bible is going to be our light on that subject. Now, in relation to that concept, I'm asking at the bottom here, so in Job chapter 8, verse 8, it's, I believe, Bildad who's talking here. And his, his, he encourages Job, or what he tells Job. I don't, what he says to Job, he says, Inquire, I pray thee, of the former age, and prepare thyself the search of their fathers, for we are but of yesterday and know nothing, because our days upon earth are a shadow. It is the case. I mean, especially if you look at some of the lifespans in the Old Testament. Do we really live that long today? We, we don't, right? I mean, we live this really brief, like, 80-year, give or take a decade uh, time span. And it, it feels like just when you're finally reaching adulthood, you're getting ready to check out. And you don't really have all this time to be, I mean, you don't have uh, the kind of time that would be nice in order to really develop yourself to pass on something, you know, of, of supreme value to the next generation in that time. Now, the reason that's going to be important is... When it comes to telling us how we got to the point that we're at in society, our kids being raised up today, they're going to be sent into, many of them, the public school system, and the things that they're going to be getting taught in the public school system are going to be getting taught to them as though they're just societal norms. And our kids are not really going to have an appreciation for the fact that many of the concepts that they're being instructed in, many of the inventions that, <laughs> that are being delivered to them, are actually brand new constructs. They have devices that are relatively new on the scene that, is, that, is, that are capable computers, that are capable of bringing them all kinds of information at the touch of a finger. It's becoming increasingly difficult for parents to even protect their kids from certain types of harmful information. But to our kids, it's all they've ever known. They're not going to be able to recall a time when things were different. And so being able to put things into context for kids is very, very important. And the Bible is a selective history that shows us the progress of humanity throughout the ages and it is, it is able to show to us to shine light on whether or not we are falling further away from what's good and sustainable in society or whether or not we're actually on the right track so evil versus righteous inventions there's a time period we see in Isaiah chapter seven sixteen for before he was a child or for before the child shall know to refuse evil and choose the good there's a time period where we don't have the capacity to be able to figure it out, to figure out good from evil. The way that we develop an understanding is we grow up and we begin to discern good and evil by reason of our study. Hebrews chapter 5, 14, and taking in what we see in the world around us. Strong meat belongeth to them that are full age, even those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. So we have the... Uh, person that is too young to be responsible for discerning good and evil. We have a period of time where we actually have the ability, if we've been oriented, to try to discern good and evil. We develop ourselves into a person that not only has the mental capacity, but also has the vim and vigor, right? We actually have the, uh, the, the energy to be able to do something with that information in this world. And then there comes a day, 2 Samuel chapter 19, verse 35, I am this day fourscore years old, and can I discern between good and evil? This individual is lamenting the fact that he's very old. He's no longer useful for service. It's hard for him to even categorize the things that are happening around him. Is, that, is this good? Is this bad? I don't know where it falls. So we have this time frame where we're actually useful, and many of the people in this room are right there in that time frame, right? We're all still very useful individuals. And it's important for us to be able to consider what's taking place around us. And that's like one of the important things about the study, are we going to be able to discern between good and evil? Because things are being invented all the time, they're taking place in real time, we're gonna be looking at some of those things in some, in some examples to come. So, now let's take a quick break. Let me just ask again. Are we all good so far? 
are we tracking with the idea of an invention can actually be a mental construct or a plan. It can result in a physical device, the way we think of an invention like a computer or a light bulb or something of that nature, but it doesn't necessarily have to be that. It could just be a philosophy. It could be a legal construct, right? Uh, the, the nature of how laws are written causes a society to fall in line with those laws. It's a construct that people wind up having to live by. These, these are all inventions. Everybody good with that? Okay. Now let's take a look at Esther chapter 9, and this is going to be, again, reinforcing the idea that an invention, a device, it can actually be just a plot, a plan, a mental construct. Esther chapter 9, verse 9, when Esther came before the king, he commanded by letters that Haman's wicked device, there's that word, Makashaba, the wicked device, which he devised, Kashab, right, there's that, that word to plan, to invent, Huh? Is it the wrong word? The wrong verse? What is it? Esther chapter 9, verse 9. That's not it. Nine. It's chapter 5, verse 9. Let's make sure we get this. 9.25? Okay. Let's see, let's see, let's see. Let's make sure we change that. Mm, slideshow. Thank you all for being attentive and helping me with that. Now, all right, now we're back in business. Esther chapter nine, verse 25, we're gonna be looking at. And this is going to be reinforcing the idea that a device, a machination, an invention can actually just be a plot when Esther came before the king, he commanded by letters that Haman, now I, I have that just so we can identify who's being spoken of, that's not actually in the text, commanded by letters that his wicked device, which he devised against the Jews, should return upon his own head, that he and his son should be hanged on the gallows. Now, uh, of, all of, the, uh, of all of the things mentioned here, uh, what is the evil device? We have gallows listed there. Is it going to be the... It's the plot against the Jews, right? That's the evil device. Now, a lot of people would look at it and they say, well, those gallows are pretty evil. That's what's being discussed here. And that's, that's the, the... I want to get away from that limitation, and I know I'm kind of belaboring that point, but I want to make sure that we understand that it's not actually, you know, it's not actually being imprecise to say that an invention, an invention can constitute a developed idea that is being used for a particular purpose. A mental construct is as much an invention as, the, as a physical object. A gallows, somebody invented that to expedite the process of ex execution. But here, the thing that's being referenced as being against the Jews, the, the wicked device, is actually the plan that is against the people. One of the ways we know that is, here at the bottom I have asterisk, note that the gallows here were going to be used to serve an evil plot, but were then used for justice. In that sense, the gallows are not actually an evil device. They were actually turned around and used to, for, you know, to execute justice. So the gallows themselves were not evil. Now, there are some physical constructs that are actually worthless in the sense that is described by the word translated evil. Let me see here. Kakos, there it went. There are some physical things, because I know we, we might start beginning to, we might be beginning to ask ourselves, well, Ian, are there any physical devices that are actually intrinsically worthless? Okay, we see that gallows are not necessarily evil because they can actually be used to serve righteousness. We know that a gun can actually be used for self-defense, and that's not an evil thing. Are there any actual physical things, or is it all about the purpose 
for which it's designed. And I'm going to say they're going to be very closely linked. Some things are so tailor suited to a purpose that they should not even exist as a physical object. And we're going to be looking at some of those things. Let's see, Esther. All right, now here we go. Now we're going to be talking about evil plots. And then we're going to get on to physical devices. Now this is kind of like some more recent news. Not exactly breaking because you know it already broke. But I'm saying like it's pretty recent. And I realize we're dealing with a smaller screen, so I'm going to... I'll be reading it. You guys can probably see that, I guess. Virginia's, this is a recent news article. Virginia's Department of Education was required by law to create model policies for school boards regarding treatment of transgender students no later than December 31st, 2020. The draft model policies are now public and require schools to use students' preferred pronouns and to allow students to use the bathroom of their choice without question. The document states that faculty and students who that the faculty and students are to use students' preferred pronouns or face disciplinary action. So it's, being, it's now being, it's a step away from being written into law that there can be disciplinary action imposed upon faculty, teachers, faculty, for not using, for not going ahead and just calling a boy a girl or a girl a boy, depending on the child's preference. In addition, faculty and staff are told to create short-term solutions should a student's parent or guardian not accept their claims of transgenderism? Does that sound like it's starting to get kind of hairy? That they would actually, that it's this close, it's just a, a breath away from being written into law, that staff are free to start making short-term solutions for a child's chosen identity, regardless of what the parents think. Now these short-term uh, solutions, they're not the only thing. Such a plan may include addressing the student at school with their asserted name and pronoun while using the legal name and pronoun associated with the sex assigned at birth when communicating with the parents or guardians. Separating worlds. We'll go ahead and make placate the parents by referring to the child uh, the way the parent wants us to, but then when we have the student alone, we're going to go ahead and play into their world that they're trying to create for themselves. So they're, they're pitting them against one another. Of course, school staff are also encouraged to provide families that aren't on board with the claims with information to get them in line, which can include calling Child Protective Services if they feel a student is being abused, neglected, or at risk of abuse or neglect by their parent due to their transgender identity. This language, if, if individuals are paying attention to the language that's being used here, they can call Child Protective Services if there is abuse, if there is neglect, or if the faculty feels there's a risk for it. Now that's extremely subjective, very op open-ended. Now, this is taking the, the power of raising a child right out of the hands of a, of a parent. Now this, this, let's see, 70, 70, 80, 90, 2000, 2010, 2020, like 50 years ago, uh, if, religious or conservatively minded individuals would have said that this was going to be the result of a particular moment in history, eventually, they would have been derided as being conspiracy theorists or uh, being a extreme in their thought. You know, people would have said, no, no, that's not what we're trying to do. We're just trying to make sure that cer a certain group is protected and there's equity involved and all that. But this all has its root in a decision, among other things, but in particular, there was a, landm a landmark uh, event that took place in the 70s with the American Psychological Association. Has anybody heard about this before? I think you probably have, right? Yeah. What happened in the 70s with the American Psychological Association? It was detailed in uh, homosexuality and the, and the uh, homosexuality and the politics of truth. In the 70s, it used to be the case that homosexuality was actually designated a uh, mental disorder. They downgraded it to a sexual orientation, basically a preference, and they did it not on the basis of any kind of sci scientific research. There was no change in the scientific literature. Nothing scientifically was revealed. They did it under political pressure from activist groups. The second that happened, people realized that the, the psychological associations could be pressured into socially engineering uh, you know, basically a, a society. It, it could be pressured into changing its definitions in order to be able to enact 
uh, legislation because that's what the, the apart from the Bible, the, the uh, American Psychological Association, the, the body of uh, psychological literature is supposed to be the guide for society. What's healthy in an individual, what's healthy in a society. Nobody wants to use the Bible anymore. They want to go with that. So when homosexual activists realized that, they realized, well, we can go ahead and start affecting social change if we can just make sure we put enough pressure on the, on the American Psychological Association. And that's exactly what happened. That happened in the 70s. And ever since, now we're at this point here where if you are a parent that disagrees, my male child is not a girl. This started just two years ago when they started hanging out uh, with uh, trans LGBT kids at school and they started looking at LGBT stuff online and all of a sudden they think they're LGBT and I'm just not convinced this is this isn't based on anything this is basically a fashion trend if that's the position the parent takes the school can actually call child social services and now there's a, a legal problem that the parent has this is like a breath away from being written into law in Virginia so now are we seeing how over time mental energy was put into this and are we seeing that it actually has a evil effect this is an evil plan this would be an, an evil invention. It's, a, it's, a, it's a, a purposed philosophy that's being imposed on society, and it's absolutely directly against what the Bible would teach. Now, as we're going forward, now we saw how in the 70s all they wanted to do was downgrade, just downgrade it from a mental disorder to a, downgrade homosexuality from a mental disorder to a, a preference, to a, a sexual orientation. And we saw how over time that genie got out of the bottle and it just got worse and worse and worse. It's very, it was very hard to bring it back. So let's consider a verse as we're going forward. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 13. But evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. Things have a tendency to keep getting worse. Once you let the genie out of the bottle, it doesn't tend to just go away or just stay exactly the same. Once, somebody becomes, once something becomes a practice, it tends to become more and more developed. It has greater and greater impact on a society. Now let's consider, everybody here been to a circus at one point or another, or a carnival? All right. Evil plots producing evil inventions. Now this, seems, uh, this doesn't seem like it's that dangerous, but again, things wax worse and worse, don't they? Knock over the milk bottles. I don't know if anybody's ever played this where you try to knock over the milk bottles with a ball. Now, uh, this game is very frequently rigged. This is coming out of an article knock over the milk bottles. It's probably the most straightforward game. On the midway, a carnival worker stacks three milk bottles in a pyramid, hands you a softball, and you cash in on your best Nolan Ryan impression, right? These bottles are often filled with lead, that way up to 10 pounds. The balls that they give you are actually pretty lightweight. They're, they're not like a regular standard softball. They're a lightweight softball, and the milk, the, the milk bottles on the bottom, each weigh 10 pounds, are filled with lead, and they're touching each other. So they're gonna be supporting one another. Knocking all of those off the platform seems like an easy task. All you got to do is make sure you connect a little bit with each one, but in reality, those bottom bottles are super heavy. The person playing the game is given the impression that these are just no normal milk bottles. They don't really ask a lot of questions about it, but really the odds are stacked against the person playing the game. So these, these carnivals get to travel from town to town, taking people's money for every turn that they take, and they hardly ever have to give anything away. Now, we don't have to, I mean, does anybody see how that's a dirty trick? kind of a dirty trick, isn't it? You're fooling somebody. It's not, it's, you want to talk about unequal weights. Not all these bottles weigh the same. Here's another one. This is the ball bounce. Now, there's a man who actually blew his life savings on this device. Okay, these things are like, they're built to keep people engaged. With this device, there's actually a spring under the board. You think you're just bouncing a ball off of a hard surface to make it into a hole. And really, there's a spring under the board that causes the ball to bounce more wildly than it would naturally, and they don't tell you about that spring. It's hidden from you. Th that Again, we would say, well, that's a dirty trick. That's not fair. You shouldn't be doing that. You should at least tell the people, well, this is the nature of the game. It shouldn't look like one thing and actually be another. You're just taking people's money. Here's another one. I don't know if anybody's ever looked at one of these, these things from the side, but the free throw games that you see at a lot of these carnivals, they're actually squished just like this. You can't tell when you're standing from the front. If you've ever seen them, there's nets on both sides. You're directly in front of it. You don't really get to get to the side. If you got to the side, you'd probably see that this thing is, is squinched shut so that you have about a, only a quarter inch of room on either side in order to be able to sink your ball. That's why, it, and your ball is overinflated to make it bouncier. 
So the odds of you actually making this and winning the game are very slim. You think you're shooting into a regular hoop and you're not. Again, we say, well, that's a dirty trick. Now, I don't know that we really have time for this. This is a clip where an individual is talking about the dangers of gambling. Now, if we see that all of those three things are pretty dirty tricks, I don't see why we would think this is okay. From a kid's perspective, we would not want our kid playing a free throw basketball game at a carnival thinking he has a chance at winning, only to learn later, oh man, they squished the hoop on me. That's not fair, that's a dirty trick. But then we say that this is an okay trick to play on the community. In the video that I'm not showing, it talks about how the slot machines that are in these facilities are designed to take advantage of a shortcoming in the human nervous system in order to keep them insanely persistent at spending their money. The argument is made, well, you know, individuals know that the odds are super high. Well, psychologists know that huge numbers are very difficult for people to appreciate. Very, very difficult. So they don't really understand how bad the odds are. And they don't, they don't understand that this thing is playing, it is triggering a reward system in their nervous system to keep them irresponsibly uh, tuned into this game to the point where you know, a lot of people wind up having serious problems. It's a dirty trick. Now, as we're talking about things getting worse over time and letting the genie out of the bottle so that things continue to get worse, we're talking about these ev evil inventions. And now we're playing up the idea that these things are, evil inventions are no light matter. They are horrible for societies. They, they, they can define the character of a society if individuals are not careful. Now, circuses have been around for a long time. Carnivals, carnivals have been around for a long time. And they've been playing these little dirty tricks for a long time. And they seem rather harmless. You're only spending 50 cents or a dollar per turn. But then that turns into the uh, state lottery, right? It's normalized. Well, now instead of playing a dirty trick, we'll let people know that the odds are ridiculous. And, and we know psychologically people don't really appreciate how bad our odds are anyway. So we'll just go ahead. They'll never have a chance of winning, even though we're kind of making them think they do and we'll take all their money that way. And then once you normalize that, then you get to actually develop a machine that is so finely tuned to the human nervous system that it keeps them just hooked into that thing like a drug addict. This is the genie, the concept. We're gonna go ahead and create a, an evil invention, a trick to con people out of their money. And then before you know it, we're actually just plugging people in like their machines and, and keeping them addicted uh, to this evil invention. Now here's a little bit more nail on the head. This is the evolution of the meth lab. It used to be that it took all of this room and an actual lab setup to produce meth. Well, people got more refined and they realized it looks dirtier, but we can produce this material out of basically an ice chest. It, you could fit it in the trunk of a car. And now they're able to produce meth with what they call the one pot method. All, that's all the room it takes, just a bottle with a tube coming out the end. The evolution over time, somebody came up with an evil invention to produce a product that, to, to get money out of people, to play on their lust. For, one, for this drug to get money out of people. And over time, it kept getting more and more refined. But in addition to it getting more refined, the quality of the product, it's more dangerous. So we see how the, and people took a lot of time and effort to set up this lab initially, didn't they? That took some real scientific effort to figure out how to produce meth. Now any old joker on the street can do it. The genie, somebody had an evil invention that they decided to devise. They, they put mental energy into it. They created a, a physical, device to bring their idea to fruition. And now it's incredibly difficult to stop because anybody on, you know, any corner drug deal, a dealer can get online and figure out how to make this stuff. Now, how are we doing on time? It's 10.50. 10.50? It's 10.48. Two minutes. Okay. So, <laughs> pornography, another evil invention. Now look, this is a man looking in the window of a porn shop in Copenhagen, Denmark in October 1969. Porn was legalized there July 1969. Now there's an approach that was taken. I'm not going to read all this to you. I'll just tell you what it says. Basically, this, this is from Forbes magazine. It talks about the evolution of the porn industry. The way that it started was you had an individual that got around le a, le a legal construct, right? There was a legal invention in place to try to prevent pornography from being distributed openly. And in order to get around that, some individuals in Germany decided we're gonna make a documentary on pornography. See, now it's protected as art. Now it's not actually pornography, it's a documentary. See how they got around it? They came up with a, with a, a legal invention to try to circumvent. They, they invented an idea, and then they brought it to fruition to affect society. They were able to kind of get around it, and they wind up showing quite a lot of the sexually explicit material in their documentary. It was selling out all over the place. Now, 
seeing that success. It says uh, D. Renzi's, that's the person who made the film, wasn't the only film to make waves that year. Andy Warhol, his controversial, controversial blue movie was also released in 1969 and it was the first movie to show explicit real sex like censorship in Denmark, which was the documentary. It got away with its obscene content on account of being considered art. Indeed, Warhol is quoted in Victor Brockes' biography of him, uh, of him saying blue movie was real, but it wasn't done as pornography. It was done as an exercise, an experiment. They were purposing to try to figure out, is this marketable? How can we get around the, the legalities that are in place? This was a contrivance. It was an evil invention. And what do we have today? It's, it's actually difficult to keep kids away from this stuff now, isn't it? This, from one shop in Copenhagen to now, good luck getting your kid through this life without being exposed to it. So now we go from pornography to doing what it did to now this is an open advertisement. Ashley Madison, this is a serious advertising campaign that they put out. And they're still doing it as far as I know. Life is short, have an affair. AshleyMadison.com. These individuals are actually in the open business of helping you cheat on your wife or husband. And how do we get there? People ask, how do we get there? Well, the genie was let out of the bottle. Somebody had an evil invention. They, conco they concocted something in their mind. They put effort into introducing it into society. And before you know it, we're so far away from the standard that we don't even know. Kids growing up now, they look at all this stuff and they think, well, this is just what the world is. Evil inventions. So inventing, inventors of evil things, we see why it would be included in a list in Romans chapter 1 of things that are detestable. And we see why it is that there's such a stern warning against this particular sin. So do we have, are there any questions that anybody has or comments? Okay, I'm going to start shutting down and get out of the way for Caleb to present his lesson.